W5 Zulu November, K1 Delta Golf, November Zero Alpha X-Ray is in the back, Ward Silver, and Randy Thompson, K5ZD, Tim, Whiskey 3 Yankee, Quebec, and Frank, W3 LPL, where are you? All right, he, he's polishing up his speech. And uh, we want to make sure that we thank uh, ICOM America for their sponsorship, also uh, DX Engineering, uh, International Radio, uh, CQ Magazine. They've all been very big supporters of Conchest University over the years. Uh, we will have color slides on the website uh, probably next week. So the black and white slides are in the book, but you will have access to the color slides um, next week off of the website. And of course, the, uh, the live stream is being recorded so that you can watch that as well. Um, how many in here are first timers? First time to Contest University. How about that? A round of applause. And how many have been to all nine Dayton CTUs? Look at that, Mitch, wow. Jerry, Wayne, that's tremendous. The inside uh, your, your bag was, was a lot of material. One of the things that was in there uh, was this book uh, published by the ARRL. And if you know somebody that would like to have a copy of this book, you can buy this book online at DX Engineering. So, um, and there are other books from past years available there as well. There are vouchers in there. There's an ARRL voucher and a uh, DX Engineering voucher that's in there. So that's, that's money, that's cash that you can use at the Hamvention. Uh, there's also, the waiver form has May 1st. If you would cross that out and put 15th in there, I would appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, at the break, you can uh, uh, give the waiver form to Terry. I would appreciate that. Um, Terry also has all the parking vouchers. So if you are not staying at the hotel, we don't want you to pay for parking if you're in the parking deck. So during the break, make sure. And uh, Ray, I would love for you to come up here and say a few words. This is Ray Novak, N9JA of ICOM America. Say thank you for everybody coming to Contest University. When Tim said this was the ninth one, it surprised me. It doesn't seem like nine years ago. Um, I received a phone call. Hey, got this idea. Where it's going to be called Contest University, held at the Crown Plaza Thursday. Hams will get there on Wednesday to attend. I go sure. Okay. <laughs> But here we are nine years later. Uh, I was about to post on Facebook. We have a full log. Have you ever had a full log on a contest? Could always get, squeeze one more in. Um, 
We're, we've introduced a, a new firmware update for all you 7600 owners uh, to give the, the features that we introduced and a lot of the a lot of the features that are introduced in the 7800 and the 7700. But the more important thing that I want to introduce today is the concept of bringing younger people into the hobby. We got a, a high school club here that it was sponsored to come in, learn about contesting. That's great. When <laughs> when Tim told me about that contest, I'm like, well, at one time I was the youngest one in the industry. I came in in 1989 and 22 years old. Well, that was a long time ago, a couple sunspot cycles. <laughs> so what we did a month ago, I hired a new guy to help me attend a lot of these events. 24 years old, Will Jordan. For you guys in Forlander, he's, he was a technician when I found him. He's upgraded to extra. He hasn't operated in a contest yet. I think he's going to get his christening in a contest at K3LR. <laughs> this is his very first Dayton. So, I mean, he's got his eyes wide open, just taking it all in. But the one nice thing about it is this room full of mentors and Elmers that can help me teach him about this wonderful hobby. So, appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you very much. Was that another three? So please, please welcome Neil Rapp and the K9SOU Bloomington, Indiana High School Amateur Radio Club. Neil? We're here because of the Northern California DX Foundation and uh, the visionaries that they are, Tom, Andy, we really appreciate that. Our uh, digital expert, Ed Munns, W0YK, is going to say a few words here. Oh. Oh. So we just have a quick uh, clerical update on, uh, on the program. If you'll go to page uh, 8 of your uh, pro that shows the, the day's program, VIII, I think it is, in Roman numerals, You'll see the two digital programs at, um, I think, 1015 and 1120. And the titles uh, are not what we're talking about. And it's important that you know this, uh, so you know what session to go to and also uh, how to vote uh, on, the, on the reruns. So the first one is going to be on technology topics. So instead of uh, going through all of RIDI from A to Z, we've picked out some specific topics in the technology area that we're going to focus on. <laughs> The second session at 11.20 is going to focus on operating topics. So I would write in your book, make that correction, because you'll need that during the day to, to know what uh, program you're on. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ed. For those of you who don't know where, where Harding is located, Harding is uh, down the hall and to the left, and Salon CD is over uh, to your left. So uh, make sure that uh, you get to the classes on time. Contest University does run right uh, on time and right to the wire. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Please welcome N0AX Ward Silver. There you go, I'm SO2R. <laughs> there we go, all right. Okay. Come on up here. Those of you that have been here nine times and you keep changing your major, okay. <clears throat> Where, w when are you guys going to graduate? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> very good. Okay, let's see, all right. Let's 
pop this puppy off. Uh, glad to see everybody here. What's the uh, numbers? Of 235. 235. Yes, that's an amazing number. So that's good. I'm glad to see a bunch of uh, new people here as well. We're going to start off with one of the most amazing um, topics. Uh, Tim needs a little more, little more RF there. Okay, more gain, more gain. One of the most amazing topics that people uh, keep coming back to in contesting, and we're going to touch on this during the talk, is how do you know if you win? And if you've ever talked to people that are um, not contesters, they, they, want, they can't quite get their mind around what a ham radio competition is at all. Um, they, don't, they might not even know what ham radio is, and you're trying to tell them you're having a sport. Well, part of the, it being a sport is, first of all, the game has to be strange. If it wasn't strange, it wouldn't be a sport. Okay, it would be a job. We don't need to get more audio. More audio, more audio. Is that right here? I'm in the zone. Okay, <clears throat> can everybody hear me now? Okay, all right. Uh, okay, we're good. Okay, so the purpose of this, now we're talking about this, this odd sport, is how do you conduct this odd sport? How does this sport actually work? And down at the foundation, down at the bottom of it, so that we can all conduct ourselves in a, in a reasonable way and have a good time, is this question of ethics. And it's down at the bottom of all sports and all games. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what ethical behavior means to contesting. We're going to talk a little bit about the impact of an unethical behavior. I don't want to dwell on that. I think primarily most people are good people. They just want to know how to, to be good. And so I want to encourage you to learn, think about this and take ownership of the behavior. That's the important part. It's you in your shack. And so it's very important that you take ownership of your own operation. Okay, so why do, we, why do we play games? Games, we want to have a good time. It's a contest, it has rules, it's an amusing thing, it's strange enough that it's not a job, although you get done on Sunday afternoon and it feels like a job. And games, you know, what, what do you get out of this? Okay, you're basically trying to exercise some capability that, that you're, uh, you're interested in excelling at. You want some peer review, you want to you get out there, you want to do something that's interesting and fun and it feels like you're getting something out of it. And so we make a game out of it so that people can enjoy it. Here's a really weird game. Look at this, all these different things. Does this, any of this look familiar? You know, you're kind of scanning through this, you know, I've got, wow, that 50,000 uh, online network spectators don't like it. Uh, what is this? Is it, is it radio contesting? No, it's actually, uh, if I can push the button here, wait a minute. Where did it go? Is this radio contesting? Uh, okay. Something has happened to the slides, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Hang on a second. Nope. Okay. All right. This unusual game, ladies and gentlemen, is birding. Okay. How many birders? Have we got any birders out there? There's a birder. I thought you were a bat boy. Okay. All right. <clears throat> birders, bats, they do the same thing. They go out. They are totally honor system driven. You drive out, you go to see all these different birds. If you've ever seen a bunch of them converge to spot a bird, you see that they have pileups, they do all this stuff. They have this own self-reporting thing. People spend zillions of dollars on it just so they can write down that they saw the, you know, the red-breasted white rump warbler, or, you know, whatever. It's an unusual game. It's very similar to ham radio. And they also have their own rules and they also have their own ethical things to talk about. So it's not radio contesting, but it's a lot like it. So why do we do these games in the first place? Okay, because they're fun, okay? Because you get on and you get on Friday afternoon and you turn on the radio and you're just working a lot of stations. It's a lot of fun to do what we do at high speed. Another thing, reason why do we do contesting if you look at the basis and purpose the fcc basis and purpose there is no list in there there's no item in those five things that says this is about to have fun radio amateurs are not they don't care whether we have fun or not but 
there's a lot of operator training and pushing the envelope and all this kind of stuff. And so we do contests as a way of operator training that's fun. And th so that's your self-improvement. And then it's satisfying. When you get done, you really feel like you've accomplished something. You look at your log, you look at your DXCC totals, you look at your score, and you've got something really good going on. Financial rewards? Not so much. <coughs> okay. Peer recognition? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, bragging rights? Uh, whatever. You know, you want to uh, conduct yourself in a way that beats the other guys. You know, and it's not like Gore Vidal said, where it's not enough that I succeed, others must fail. It's not like that. Okay. It's you, everybody can succeed, everybody can get better. Okay. So there are internal things. All right, that's the fun, the self, the personal, the financial, and then there's an external thing, which is the peer recognition. Now, financial rewards, we know we don't really do the financial rewards, so uh, as any spouse can tell you. <coughs> now, why is this doing this? Okay, there we go, financial rewards. Peer recognition, this is different than the one I was practicing this morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, okay, so I'm, I'm a jazz improvisation guy. Okay, so let's talk about peer recognition. Um, I want to be recognized as a good contester, all right? I want to be recognized by my achievements. I want to also be recognized for how I went about achieving those things. And, you know, this, this whole recognition, we are not isolated people. We are all in this room together. We all came to Dayton. We all read our magazines. We all get online and talk. It's a community. And so the idea of peer recognition within that community is really very important. So it's not just the fact that you won or the fact that you have a big station or the fact that you have a big score. It's how you went about it. Okay. There are negative peer recognition. So there's good peer recognition and there's bad. Okay, and so here's some examples. And you know, we've all gone through this, you know, it's like this guy was too loud, uh, this station uh, wasn't IDing, uh, I think uh, this guy was cheating on packet, all these different things. There's something not quite right about it. It's not like we are all out on a racetrack someplace or on a baseball diamond where there's an umpire. We are all doing this isolated basically all by ourselves. I can't think of any other sport where the competitors all get together, beginning of the sport, and they all say, okay, we're gonna go do this, and then they go do it, and they leave. And they all go to individual places where you can't see them, and then they come back two days later, and they give you a written record of what they did. Now that's kind of strange. And then somebody has to figure out and validate what these claims are. Okay, so, there's certain things about this. This is a very unusual sport, very solitary, that you don't really have uh, measuring sticks for a lot of this. It's this thing where an example can't quite be proven. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't smell right. It smells bad, something like that. Those are negative peer recognition things. And so this whole concern about ethics and how you conduct yourself, the whole point is to steer you into the good peer recognition and steer away from the negative things. All right, ethics is based on respect. If I don't have respect for you, if I don't have respect for myself, if I don't have respect for the game, I really don't have anything. It, it's all based on respect. I have to understand that you are in there, you are a human being, you have needs, you have these desires, and we all have these, the same commonality of purpose. And so that respect for each other is underlying all of this. You gotta have respect for everybody else in the game. Every other station that's out there operating, they also have a right to be there. They also have needs. They also have uh, skills. They also have concerns. They're just like you. And you have to recognize that. And you have to behave in such a way that, that they will have respect for you and you have respect for them during the game. You have to respect the game. And how many times you hear this from, from top level athletes and you say, well, I really just have a lot of respect for the game and I try to conduct myself in a way that's good for the game and um, I really am 
pleased that the game recognizes me. And they talk about the game as an ongoing activity. It's of human beings. Human beings do this sport. They do this game and they take it out uh, year after year. It's a lifetime, consecutive lifetime kind of thing. Baseball has been around for 150 years. And so there's a lot of respect for that whole organization and structure. And so you've got to conduct yourself in a way that furthers that structure. That's what respect for the game means. And finally, you've got to have respect for yourself. The person looking back at you from the bathroom mirror every morning is the person that you have to live with. It's a person you have to uh, feel good about. It's the person that has to recognize you. So you've got to have respect for others, respect for the game, and respect for yourself. Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin's a great uh, uh, example here. And we talk about ethics, and Calvin's telling uh, Hobbes about how he thinks he should just be able to do whatever he wants, uh, anytime he wants, and, and nobody else really counts. And Hobbes says, yeah, great. So pushes him into the mud, and Calvin says, hey, what did you do that for? And uh, Hobbes says, well, I thought you said you could do anything you want, anytime. And Calvin says, yeah, but I just meant for me. Okay. And that th we've got to make sure that when we operate and you know we're, we're doing our sort of broad shoulders thing down on 20 meter foam, that's where the ethics really meet, the rubber meets the road. It's like uh, K7QQ once said, a clear frequency on 20 meter phone is where the needle comes off the right hand peg a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so that's, that's where you really learn about you know, uh, ethical behavior, but you know, it's, it's this kind of thing where it's not just you, it's about everybody else. And everybody else has these same needs and desires and how do you compete with somebody but compete ethically. There are different, different ways and we're repeating this. I don't know why we're repeating this. Okay, to get respect, you have to give respect. That's the whole point. If, if I am competing with you and you know, I'm, I'm kind of bumping up against you a little bit, and you're bumping up against me a little bit. We have to do that in the right way. There are ways to compete, and there are ways not to compete. So if you can compete respectfully, you can do this. And so as a consequence of recognizing that, we develop ethics. Okay, now there's a process with the ethical thing. First you observe, and then you judge, and then you act. And then you repent. Okay, <laughs> and we go around this cycle over and over and over and over again. You know, nine steps forward and eight steps back, and and every time we go through the cycle, we learn a little bit, um, or and we can learn in the good way, or we can do in the bad way. And uh, Roy Llewellyn, W7EL, uh, in his early days of putting Easy Neck out there when it was copyable and things like that, he said. Your conscience is like a little sharp wheel. And when the conscience digs into you a little bit, every time it does that, every time you do something that makes the conscience wheel just dig into you a little bit, its teeth get a little duller. And if you don't pay attention to that, eventually it wears down and you lose your conscience. So this, this whole process of observe, judge, act, repent, you have to keep the teeth sharp on that wheel. You have to keep aware of your ethical behavior and your respect for others in the game. Let's see what comes up next. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Ethics denote the theory of right and wrong. Now I'm not trying to make this into philosophy 101. Everybody uh, has their own way of thinking about this, but basically ethics are about what's right and wrong. And so there are written and unwritten rules of the game. Now we can write down all sorts of rules and things, but there are also things that we can't write down and so they're sort of guidelines or where the good arrow points or understandings. Morals within ethics uh, indicate the practice. So basically after you establish this whole ethics thing, it's like morals then are the good versus the bad within the ethical structure. Now there will be a quiz on this at the end and you'll have to write a small essay to get out of the room. And so basically, when you summarize it all up, it's knowing the difference between right and wrong and choosing to do what is right. It's not knowing what is right and wrong and choosing to do the wrong thing, it's knowing what's right and wrong and choosing how to do the right thing. 
Oh, even when no one is looking, or even when you think no one is looking. Uh, with SDR technology, people are out there looking. And soon, it will not be that long before all of our radio contests are all archived online for you to browse through any frequency from anywhere in the world at any time. At, even in the future, I can go back and say, what was N0AX doing on 35, 38, uh, and 2018 sweepstakes? And I can tune that in, and I can listen to myself in the past do that. You will be able to do it. I will be able to listen to you. It's a public thing. Even though we all go into our basement, and we disappear for two days, and we come out with our written record, okay, in the future, none of that will apply. It will all be public. This is a public thing. We all do this stuff in public. We have worldwide signals. Expect to be exposed to public scrutiny. I think that's the reasonable thing. So the idea that nobody is watching, um, that's, that's over with. Th that era is rapidly coming to a close. So still, even still, with your signals being exposed and being able to be watched at any time by anybody anywhere, there are still going to be decisions that we all have to make every day about how we operate, how we choose the frequency, how we respond to people, how we don't respond to people, uh, how we uh, react to something unpleasant, uh, all these different things, we're still going to have unobservable rules. Why do ethics matter? I think I'll let it go at that. <coughs> So the summary of this part of the talk is without ethics and respect, you got nothing. You got nothing, okay? I don't know why you're doing it if you don't have ethics and respect, but you don't got nothing, okay? Without ethics and respect, we don't have radio sport. We don't have radio awards. We barely have amateur radio at all. So the point is you got to think about this. All right, so now we're trying to explain radio contesting to a non-ham. This is always interesting, isn't it? <coughs> okay, yep, uh, we do this. We log all the stations, and uh, they kind of get this part. They understand this part. Okay, oh, this is cool. Pins and a map. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Got it. Um, how do you know who won? And you know it's coming. Okay, <laughs> so, and you go, well, uh, we write it all down, and we send in this log thing, you know. To some. You mean... You're not playing it online. No, 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 no. We write it all down and we send in a written record of what we do. Okay, well, how do you prevent cheating? Oh, well, we've got written rules, all right? That's the document that's in CQ, it's in QST, it's online, the contract sponsors do it. It's all full of thou shalt, thou shalt not, may, can, should, must, all these prescriptive and, and uh, similar words. Then there's these unwritten rules. Okay. Then there's the expectations about behavior. Reasonable expectations are so important. And the idea that you expect people to conduct themselves in certain ways. And when they don't, even if it's not written down, you get, you get mad. You know, it's just like you had this expectation that X was going to happen and X didn't happen. Or you had an expectation that Y was not going to happen and it did anyway. Uh, and it, it offends your sense of dignity, your sense of ethics. We have sort of norms, and then we have gray areas. And I was in several conversations last night where people said, I think you should be able to do X. And the other person said, no, you can't do X. Um, and they, they couldn't come to an agreement on that. But these are not written rules. They're unwritten rules that are expectations that we have for ourselves and for others. Some written rules are really, really clear. I mean. There's a, there's a good example. Output power. It's something you can measure. It's something that you can verify. It's, it's a metric that we can all uh, share, we can all look at. But you've got to play fair. Okay, just because the knobs go to 11, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't mean that you can turn it all the way up. Um, there's a lot of, we have our little terms for this, you know, uh, yeah, I bought that uh, 10 kilowatt amp, I need headroom. <laughs> Yeah, I need headroom, right, okay. Uh, and there's uh, the iMac antenna tuner and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so, so we kind of wink at that. That's, that's a time-honored tradition in amateur radio, less and less every year. That's an ethical decision uh, where you've got to decide if your amp goes to 11, do you turn it to 11 or do you turn it to nine, whatever. 
It's a decision we all make. What are other examples of written rules? Here's some. You've seen them all. You know, you can look in any magazine, any contest. You can see lots of written rules. But let's talk about the unwritten rules. There's a very important distinction. Just because you can do something is not a recommendation that you should do something. Now, we could go through all the fine points and the contest rules could be written so that they cover more and more and more <laughs> specific things until they become an impenetrable hedge of, of logical, legalistic rules. We don't really want that. We can't do it because we only have finite amount of resources and this is still a hobby even though there's a fine line between hobby and obsession and we probably crossed it, the fact that we're sitting in this room. But can is not the same as should. And since we're not going to write down everything, we all have to think about this difference between can and should. Okay, so do we have the model where everything that is not specifically prohibited is allowed? Or do we have the model that everything is, that is not uh, specifically prescribed for you to do is prohibited? There's kind of a, an odd difference there. We can't possibly specify every type of behavior in a contest. Can't. Um, if you wrote it all down, it might be perfectly clear uh, to the person writing it down, but it's also very hard to understand. Uh, when somebody asked Niels Bohr, the physicist, um, a long time ago, they said, what is complementary to truth? And he said, clarity. You can be specific, you can be precise, you can be accurate and it can be completely ununderstandable. So the idea is we have to balance the written rules versus the unwritten rules of, of expectations. Okay, here's an unwritten rule. Everybody expects that you contest on the radio and within the contest period. Okay, well, what happens at 2359? What do you do? Some of us immediately, without even thinking about it, go send and off it goes. Other people, want to go through and they want to make sure that they typed everything correctly. Other people go farther. And in the old days it was not unheard for people to record entire contests and then play them back. Uh, these people obviously had no life whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and would re go through every contact to make sure that the contact was correct. And it would take days and days and days and days. Okay, right? That you have unwritten expectations about what other people are doing. And maybe you're outraged to realize that somebody else goes back and look at their, their log. So maybe you're outraged that somebody went and changed an O to a zero. Maybe you're outraged that you are expected to send in your log without looking. There are some gray areas. We all have to make some decisions. Okay, what's important really is don't give or take unfair advantage of others. I mean, that's, that's basically when somebody comes in a big gun station and you're low power or QRP and they just squash you like a bug and take your frequency, that's a violation of an entry rule. There's no rule in CQ Worldwide says thou shalt not interfere with a QRP station. Um, <laughs> how would it, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've done it. You know, it's, it's like uh, we all were jostling for position and frequencies and all this kind of stuff. but. Try not to do it in a way that's unfair, that you know that you're doing it. And if you were in their shoes, you would resent it, okay? Have respect for others. Have respect for the game and, and try to conduct yourself in a way that's not unfair to others. And you got to look at the rules as a set and say, what is the mission of this contest? Why are we contesting? What are they trying to accomplish here? What are the rules trying to get at? What are these underlying principles of this contest so that I can conduct myself in accordance with those principles and not necessarily worry about a legalistic uh, list of things? Here's some more examples. Do not make prearranged schedules. Okay, outside the contest. That's just, just kind of not okay. But inside the contest, do identify frequently. That's a good thing. Don't ask friends to work you only, okay? But do encourage club members to get on and work everybody. Go ahead and work me, but then go on. Keep going, work everybody else. The idea is to get on and give everybody points. Don't work your friends with multiple calls. We all have somebody that'll call us and then they'll give you a call and then you 
hear them and they call you again and they give you their spouse's call and then they give you the club call and then they give you their college alma mater call and then they give, you know, it's just like, okay, stop. Enough. One station, one call. Do works and spot stations equally. Don't just be a cheerleader, okay? Work everybody, spot everybody. It's all about everybody working everybody else. This is a cooperative contest. The best contesters are the ones who cooperate the best with everybody else. We don't withhold our contacts. We don't withhold our spots. Everybody is equal. Everybody is out there together. Do not call or text message multipliers. <laughs> that used to be, you know, I, I, it's crazy, you know, that you even have to say this, but, you know, every once in a while, you know, it was, it was, famous for many years before somebody finally wrote this down. You cannot use non-amateur means to contact other stations during the contest. So do not call, do not text, do not instant message, do not tweet, you know, whatever. But do make an effort. See, these we got these do's and don'ts here, you know. Make an effort to help these casual guys to call in and say, I just wanted to give you some points. Make them feel welcome. Bring them in. Treat them like you would want to be treated. Do not let others help your single out of effort. Don't ask somebody to hold your frequency while you go to the bathroom. You know, that, that kind of thing. If you're single op, it's single op, okay? Empty your own damn jug, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole list of this stuff uh, on the ARL, HF contesting guidelines, okay? It does not mention jugs, okay? But um, it's got a lot of these discussions. There's a whole set of these these things where there's like a question and answer kind of a dialogue that helps you define where these unwritten rules are. Log washing. Sanitize for your protection. Okay, so the contest bell goes off and you've got this log thing and the deadline is days and days and days away. Uh, what are you supposed to be doing then? That's an artifact from years and years ago when we actually wrote on paper. I, I know that's hard to remember and understand, but we actually wrote things down. And uh, so you had the certain amount of time to go through and correct your handwriting and uh, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's not a prescription to go out and then immediately start going through your log to see if you want to change something from what you did work to what you think you should have worked. When you start doing that, you're, you're crossing over the line into log washing. There's all these different ways. Those of you that are taking notes on different ways to wash your log, we're watching. Okay. <coughs> it's over when the clock rolls over. Okay. That's it. If you make notes during the contest that, oh, K1DG, he's really in Colorado for some reason, um, and I logged him, but I rolled off the screen before I could fix it. If you made a note to yourself during the contest, that's fine. But after the contest is over, it's over. You don't, you don't get to go back and say, you know, gee, I. If I could just have taken that shot on hole eight with a number six iron instead of a number seven iron, I'm going to do that. I'm going I'm to go back and change that a little bit. You don't get to do that in any other sport. Okay. Now you're talking about cheating. Cheating is there's there's like make, do you make a mistake? Everybody says you know you catch the guys you know with steroids you know out the bazoo and all this stuff. Says, I made a mistake. Uh, you didn't make a mistake. You went out and you bought the stuff and you arranged to have this stuff and you tried to hide it and you committed fraud, okay? You didn't make a mistake. All right, we're not talking about making mistakes here. We're talking about actively cheating. So how do you justify it? You, you finally catch them. Oh, blah, blah, blah. We've heard it all. Anybody who's a, a father of a, a, you know, a teenager or something like that, you heard it all. We've been on both sides of this. Okay. Nobody was watching. I had to do it. I, I could gain a lot of it. I, I have a little station. I have to do this to win. There's all these different things. Don't let this <laughs> cancer get into you, okay? Um, all the guys at the top are cheating. I hear this all the time, especially in general clubs where you go and talk to say, oh, those guys are all running 10 kilowatts. You know, you're all cheating. And I said, no, they are not. And unlike a lot of other areas in life, the farther up you get in the food chain of contesting, the less cheating there is. It's a very unusual thing. It's because there's no money in this. If there was any money in this, you bet there'd be cheating, you know. Uh, but there's no money in this, okay? You certainly, 
there's negative money in this, as a matter of fact, okay? So, so people are not cheating at the top. They are just very, very good. There are some, there are some notable examples, I mean counterexamples. And when I say there's no cannibalism in the Royal Navy, I mean of course there is a certain amount, okay? But, but basically, they're not cheating. And they're helping each other operate ethically. And the people that come up to their stations, they try to make sure they operate ethically. It's a very unusual situation. And I think we should take steps to recognize and preserve it. Okay. Basically, the mindset is the contagious malady. Don't let it get a foothold on you or your peers. Okay. Oh, I'm not a big gun, it doesn't matter if I turn the amp up. Uh, uh, bad habits early, bad habits later. Uh, as the boy becomes the man, as they say, and as the novice contester becomes the big gun, your reputation will follow you a long time. How many people have been at this sport for 40 years or more? Okay, that's a long time. Okay, and people remember. So it's hard, it's dealing with temptation, you really want to get through that pileup, you're sitting there, you're at 100 watts, if you could just turn it up to 200, you could work the sky and get, you know, don't do it. All right, technology. Technology enables all sorts of interesting behaviors, doesn't it? Okay, you get more options, you get, so there's got to be another rule. Well, if there's another rule, then you've got to make another decision, and then you make a bad decision, and then there's more bad decisions, and so it's just a, a big sucking hole that, that will take you down. So ethics is more important than ever. When you're confronted with a new technological option that can convey an advantage or allows you to take an advantage, um, you've got to be thinking about this when you implement and act. The respect is more important than ever. The more technology we apply to the problem, the more important the human angle becomes. And the human angle is respect. So you got to figure out where your good arrow points. Wherever this is. Where does my good arrow point? What am I trying to do here? Where, what, how do I want to be remembered? How do I want to interact with others? Where is my good arrow pointing? And then when you have to make a decision on everyday basis, then you've got to say, I don't have a, a set of written rules here. I don't have a measurement. I don't have a spec. I've got to make a decision. Okay, the decision has to line up with my good arrow. And it's the same thing in your company. It's the same thing at home. It's the same thing in your religion. It's the same thing in contesting, which is sort of a religion. But anyway, where does your con good arrow point so that when you have to make a decision on the spot without a manual, how do you make that decision? Where do you go? And it's all about this honor system thing. And that sounds corny, but it's really true. You are responsible for your own reputation. How do you do that? It's very simple. You follow the rules and you don't participate with people that cheat. You lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. Okay? So, you know, remember that. And all these proverbs start coming out of the woodwork, they're all true. Lead by example. I think people will follow somebody who's got the, the cojones, uh, pardon me ladies, uh, to stand up and say, okay, I think we should do this and not this. And people respect that, they appreciate it, and you will gain in their eyes, you will gain in your own eyes, and the game will be better for it. Respect, respect, respect. Be vocal. Okay, this is hard, especially, you know, everybody thinks that the, the big guns rule everything and they really don't. It's this mid-level stuff where people see somebody behaving in a way that's not quite cool. Uh, they've turned up their audio gain too high or they've got the amp too high or something. It doesn't take a giant Spanish, no one expects a Spanish Inquisition. Okay, it doesn't take the Spanish Inquisition. It's just a little bump on the shoulder, say, Turn it down a little bit. Let's, let's back off. Let, let's don't do that. When I was a kid and fooling around with the ham radio club in high school, I thought it would be neat to steal a guy's frequency. And, uh, you know, this other guy, I wasn't even licensed at the time. I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was having a great time. Hey, this is all right, you know. And uh, yeah, we contested and built bedroom until his mom threw us out, you know. And we could not use the phonetics. Whiskey brings joy. She was a Baptist. Forget it. Okay. So anyway, I, t I said, I, I'm going to steal this guy's frequency. Ah! And Bill leans over to me and says, you 
can't do that. What are you doing? And I, it, it was like, what? And he just made a huge difference to me. He has no idea how important that was to me at that point in my life to have an older guy, just a year older, say, oh, no, we don't do it that way. It makes a huge difference, a huge difference to other people to lead by example. Peer pressure is important. What is peer pressure? We all know what peer pressure is, you know, pressure to conform, pressure to comply, pressure to follow, and everybody's good arrow sort of lines up. Good, encourage others to follow the rule. People respect those who they see following their own rules. One thing to stand up in a club meeting and say, we should all run 1,500 watts and no more, and then they know if you go home and crank it up to 11, okay, they know. What about bad things? Okay, other people talking you into, nah, it's all right, we'll run you know, a couple kilowatts tonight on 75, we gotta, and, and you go along with it, and then you kind of feel like you need to go home and take a shower, okay, uh, it's not good. And this whole everybody else is doing it, everybody else is not doing it. I think we lose sight of it, we have visual uh, and, and vocal instances that get blown up by the media and other things where you have somebody who's transgressing and it becomes this big deal and it taints this entire activity. It's not so. 99% of the people here are trying to do good things, okay? Don't lose sight of that. Don't let yourself be dragged away from that just because of this participation that somebody else is doing it. Okay, here's the code of birding ethics. We talked about the birders and their binoculars and stuff. There's their statement. They expect birders to police birding, <coughs> just like amateurs self-police amateur radio. It's very important. So apply the positive peer pressure. Be aware of your motors. It, if, it, if it's going to be a personal thing between you and this other person, you got to back off a little bit. Maybe it's, it's helpful to have somebody else take the message out. I've, I've been involved and people get mad at each other and then they're not speaking and something and you need that that third or fourth person to sort of take the issue away, make it less personal and help the parties resolve it. Okay, it's, These are interpersonal skills that we all need to learn. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, At least a couple of times. You know, Sometimes people do make mistakes. It's that fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh that it's not a mistake anymore. But they may not realize what they're doing. Like I was this kid in the steel frequency. I thought it was cool. Okay, and the, the other guy says, no, no, you don't do it that way. We, we don't operate that way. Okay, but take the opportunity to encourage somebody to do the right path. You know, don't get on them. Don't get in their face right away. Help them say, look, let's, let's do this the right way. Choose the right time and place. Don't call them out at a club meeting and try to embarrass them and all this kind of stuff. Can they listen without feeling personally attacked? And that's something that you have to sort of, you have to put yourself in their shoes. You have to assume that they are not terribly unlike yourself. And so how would you react if you were confronted with this in certain ways? And how would you like to be informed? You, you can't be angry or accusatory right off the bat. If they continue to do it, that's another story. But basically, start by treating these things as a mistake. Everybody gets a chance or two. You're, you're just basically trying to help them do the right thing. Have respect for that other person. And be there, okay? When, when people cheat, you've got to, actually, this is the hard part, is deciding to take action. And it's hard, and I've had to do it a couple of times. And every time I've done it, it's rewarded me. I felt terrific after, and the other person has changed their behavior a little bit, and we got along, we got better. But it was very hard. You know, we don't have confidence in that we want to go up to other people and, and basically talk to them about a shortcoming that they, they have when we know that we have shortcomings ourselves. Samuel Johnson said, humanity must be really terrible because I think myself one of the best, and I know how bad I am. Okay. <coughs> Okay, and then you've got to deliver the message so that the receiver actually receives it. Some people are, they, they just are tone deaf, 
or whatever, you've got to figure out how they can listen and understand what you're saying. You've got to say it in language that they want to hear, in, in terms that they want to use. Here's some scenarios, okay? Uh-oh, somebody's using the spots. What do you do? Here's some options. Uh, she doesn't win anything, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you just shun her uh, publicly, call her out as a cheater. Do you send a letter to the contest sponsor? Bas basically, you could say, are you aware that this is a problem? You know, there's lots of different ways to tackle this. Here's another scenario. Uh-oh, they've got it all turned to 11. What do you do? Well, <laughs> what the heck? You know, <laughs> loud is good, let her rip. Uh, whenever you get on, turn it down to 1500 watts and see if anybody else notices. Um, and you could basically try to talk other people into turning it down. You could take the owner aside and say, you know, uh, Ward, <laughs> You always run this much gas, you know. Uh, you could just leave. You could just say, sorry, I'm out. And I've done several of those things myself, okay? Uh, not the running high power part, okay. Uh, <coughs> there's lots of things you can do. You have options, you have to decide. And I don't know what happened to the start, but basically the idea was scenario three was somebody is clicking madly and uh, they're right next to you. So uh, they move right in, clickety click, 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 click. So what do you do? Uh, you turn your rise time down to 0.1 microsecond and you let them have it. Uh, or you go and you send clicks or blah, 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 blah. There's lots of different things. These are the points where you have to line up your good arrow, you have to put on your big boy panties and decide what to do. Up, oh, see? There you go. Here's a contest code of ethics. If you go to the WWROF site, <laughs> Worldwide Radio Operator Foundation, there are some guidelines for you. These are the things that, that you want to read and take note of. In the right way, okay, you're gonna play fair, you're gonna obey the rules, you're gonna try to do better next time, you're gonna improve your skills in station, you make your enjoyment of contesting be about the journey, not about the destination. You know, we all want to be at the top, we all want to be in the top 10 box, all this kind of stuff, but you can't get into this, uh, if I succeed, others must fail stuff. Okay, so how are you going to do it? It's the journey, not necessarily the end of it. You've got to ask yourself, what does the winning the contest really mean to you, and how is your important is your radio identity? This is really very, very, very important. Okay, these are the questions that control how you act on the air. And who is the final judge? It's the person in the bathroom mirror looking back at you every morning. You have to look yourself in the eye and say, did I operate in a way that I can be proud of? And your peers will also let you know, don't be that guy, okay? Yeah, I know that guy, he cheats. Believe me, it's out there. People know, they will find out, this is not something trying to intimidate you into doing something differently. The idea is to give you the confidence and the encouragement that if you find an ethical and respectful way of conducting yourself, you will benefit from it, the sport will benefit, and others will benefit. The final thought, it's all about the golden rule. Everything is about the golden rule. Do as to others as you would have them do unto you operate in a way that you would expect others to operate. Nothing else matters. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
So um, we're going to uh, split the room. Ward, if you would tell the uh, folks right outside the door to come in. We're going to split the room in half. There are th uh, four sessions that will go on. In the Harding room, Joel Harrison, W5ZN, will be doing the VHF contesting. That starts at 9 o'clock. Um, in room A, which is to your right, uh, will be the practical upgrades for your 40 through 10 meter antennas with Frank W3 LPL in Salon B, which is on your left. Salon B is on your left. Uh, this, this room will be split in half. Is the uh, CW and RTTY skimmer presentation with N6TV. And then to your far right in Salon CD is uh, Randy Thompson on why Cabrillo is important to you. So please uh, adjust yourself according to what you would like to see and enjoy.